Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's about improving the life, well-being, and productivity of mechanics everywhere. I am your host, Mr. Joshua Taylor, founder of Wrench Turners Online, and today we have a very special guest, somebody who has been making content probably way more than I have for a long period of time on multiple platforms on TikTok and on YouTube. You can find him in both places as The VW Mechanic, and it is Rob Buttrick. Rob, thank you very much for taking a few minutes today and, and sitting down with us and maybe sharing some life stories. Absolutely welcome. Glad to be here. Awesome. 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 So, Rob, we've, we've had a little bit of conversation, not a whole lot. And some of the folks that are, that are probably listening, maybe most of the folks, if not all the folks that are listening, probably don't know who you are. So let's, let's dive into a little bit of, of who you are. And then maybe, uh, you know, what was that first, you know, first thing, that first clue? What got you into the trade? So um, I'm Rob, I'm from the United Kingdom, or England, the United Kingdom split up into so many things. Anyway, um, I've been in the trade now for about 17 years. So fresh out of school, I was uh, didn't really want to be in cars, to be fair. I wanted to be an electrician or policeman. Anyway, um, for one reason or another, electrician was definitely out of my maths range. <laughs> <laughs> and the police weren't taken on at the time, so... I had a bit of a weird thing about remembering car reg plates, car license plates. Don't know what it was. Could always remember them. It didn't, didn't even know what the car was, but I remember the reg. I could put it to a car. Crazy, right? But one thing that always, always stuck in my mind was uh, my granddad. My granddad was a mechanic in the British Army in, uh, in just after World War II, to be fair. And... Um, I used to watch him tinkering in the garage um, and any time my mum or my auntie had a problem with their car, he'd come round, he'd be in the garage and he'd be doing all kinds of, he'd be doing head gaskets with no special lifting gear and probably six spanners and two sockets kind of thing. And he'd used to make his tools to do it and when so, you watch someone do that, and as a child, it really don't mean anything to you. You think, oh cool, that's going to work in a bit and, and all's well and it's not cost anything. But looking back on that, I think that was the turning point for me is to, wow, I could do that. I could be like that man who's now my hero. Um, and maybe I could fix cars in the garage with, without any lifting gear or, or, do you know, help family out and that kind of thing. And I think it has subconsciously stemmed from that, whether I wanted to be a policeman or whether I wanted to be an electrician, that, that's kind of always been in the back background of my mind of, you know, can I be like my granddad? Awesome. I think we're both kind of similar, similar pages here. My, my grandfather and I are one of my earliest memories was standing with my, my grandfather in the garage um, after helping him take off the carburetor off what was back then big red. I mean, an old square body 2500 Chevy, big old, big old truck that he had pulled the box off the back and made a wooden, wooden frame, um, uh, rear ramp and so on and so forth in the back and we had just taken the carb off and i just remember standing on a stool in the garage on his made bench that he made himself and and everything up like just about everything my grandfather made and i just remember standing there i just have this picture almost like almost like out of body third person shooter kind of picture of the two of us standing at the bench pulling this thing apart and you know earliest fondest memories um with my grandfather you know probably laying laying that first frame of of so to speak of of getting into the trade that's awesome okay cool we'll get back to it so you you grew up spending time with your grandfather understand what you're doing and for some now for those folks who who don't necessarily reg if i'm not mistaken is license plates correct yes cool and how you guys are now, so this is one of the things that I don't a hundred percent understand the difference between Canada, US, and the UK in terms of license plate. A, the license plates are entirely different between basically North America and the UK. The long, skinny versus the short and fat. So that's just design. Now, I understand that in Britain, if I'm not mistaken, that plate stays with the car. So it's not ownership specifically because it almost feels like in, in North America, our plates are more to the person, not to the car. Because when we register the car, 
we buy plates and we put plates on the car. When we change ownership of the car, it we take our plates off. They take the vehicle without plates on it or drop it off or however we do it. And they transfer the ownership in their name and they buy new plates. Yeah. I've never seen anybody buy plates or transfer plates in our country before. And I don't know if that's even a thing in the States, but that's that literally the car goes, the plate goes with the car when you buy them. Yes. Correct. But in the United Kingdom, it's you've got a couple of scenarios. So all cars come with a registration or a license plate from factory or when they were registered. Um, so that can be whatever it comes with, but you can have a personalized plate, which I've got a personalized plate on my own car, which I would do what you do in Canada and take the plate off and then put it on my next car. So the car will always have in the background its original reg plate, but you can swap that to a private plate if you want to. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. I learn learn a little bit of new bits every day. Cool. So you, <laughs> your grandfather got you in, in in the in the statement that got you interest in it. What was what was the the first shop like what what transitioned you from from early life into becoming a mechanic what was what was the that first day did you walk into a dealership did you walk into a small shop did did someone help you in how did that go so what i did when i uh, i first applied at a local college um and the way they do it here in um england is you apply to the college and you get accepted onto the course which at the time was um what we call an apprenticeship or day release so that's essentially where you do four days a week at college and then you do one day a week at a workplace. Um, but the one thing about the colleges in the United Kingdom is you have to find your own workplace. They don't assign you a workplace. They don't give you any sort of clue. You've got to go and try and find it like you would do in a, a full employed job. So you'd have to go around and speak to people, hand out your resumes and and that kind of thing. So it's two challenges in one, really, to to get it started. Interesting. That doesn't that doesn't sound very beneficial for the apprentice to try and figure out because you're you're effectively now. I, I, I'm still not sure whether high school is high school in Britain or not. But you have basically fresh out of school, yeah. and you know, eighteen year old doesn't matter you man or woman coming fresh out of high school. You don't know shit from shit, and you're expected to figure out how to write a resume, figure out how to interview, apply to a college at the same time figure out how to canvas people, how to sell yourself, try to get into a, a facility that will sponsor you and try to get into college at the same time. And then you are expected to not only learn four days a week, something that you've never learned before, but also try to start working in a place where you probably or perhaps even never worked before all at the same time. That just sounds like a one big ball of stress and fire and brimstone. Absolutely. But if you've made it that far, then you've put in a lot of the groundwork straight away, haven't you? So as as an employer, if you're walking around to different garages trying to find a job, if you've done all that to start with, they're going to see, oh, he's got a bit of dedication about him. This this chap, he's, he's definitely worth sort of taking a punt on because he's managed to do all that straight out of school, no experience, nothing like that. And he's, he's got it all ticked off and he's ready to go. So that's another good selling point if you're having an interview as to why you should be employed by this person. Interesting. Well, it does definitely do that. Like if somebody's willing to put in the time, energy and effort to make all of that stressful abomination work, uh, they have to have a, a bit of that, that uh, drive and ambition in them. Okay, cool. So what was the first, like, was it a dealership or an independent, the, the first store that you ended up at? It was a local taxi firm or cab firm. Um, that uh, essentially just looked after the fleet of their own own vehicles. Um, so that's yeah, that's exactly where I started, and yeah, that was an interesting experience. Tell us a bit about about that, that interesting experience, because I'm I'm always interested in hearing that first year because it's such that there's such a dichotomy in in how people start because some have a very easy time very easy to learn, have have a great mentor right off the rip and, and so forth. And then there's other folks who literally just like, it's like shoveling shit every single day until you earn earn your keep as it were. So I'm interested. It, exactly that. It, it was like shoveling shit. Um, and to the most point, that's pretty much what I was doing. Um, so the fleet of taxis that we were looking after, you had to do daily checks on, there were so many scheduled to come in at certain points of a day. 
So you'd have to check the tires, check the lights, make sure everything's working so the vehicle's road legal. Um, in doing so, you'd have to fit a good sort of 100 tires a day. So I got, got really good at fitting tires pretty fast. Um, and, and bulbs, same on any car, you've got that much space to get that much hand in to replace the bulb. Uh, so I got pretty good at them. And the worst bit was um, they used to buy accident damaged cars to take parts off to put onto the taxis to obviously make it cheaper to repair. So I would be taking alternators off cars that are parked in the corner of a compound, in the mud, in the puddles, in the snow, to then put on another car to get the car back out. Because all these cars are rapid turnaround. They needed to be out ASAP. Um, so, yeah, doing that on my back with with not many tools and it was a bit cold i'm not gonna lie uh he certainly got the experience up there pretty fast wow that's that that is definitely for you that's definitely a a, a trial by fire again because uh, now you're not just working in a shop you're working trying to figure out how to do things on your own outside pulling off stuff and in all likelihood uh, you're, by your own omission, not many tools, but probably not very many instructions either. It's probably, I need the alternator off that. Well, at that particular point in time, you probably don't necessarily know what an alternator is or what it does or how to take it off the thing that they've told you to. And because it's schmucked up outside in the muddle in the put in the mud and, and so on and so forth, it's what kind of car is it? What kind of, sorry, let me rephrase that. What kind of car was it? Because it may not be much of something left if they bought accident cars to pull parts off interesting well we've had this conversation before on on the podcast where buying broken things and fixing them is a great way uh, as a as a young mechanic to learn your craft and learn your trade they've effectively done that before you they put a whole bunch of wreck shit out in the parking lot it's like okay i need this and this and this and this and go find it and get it off here and bring it in and then we're going to put it on those cars well okay interesting interesting so that was what your whole entire first year was like, eh? So like pulling wrecks cars apart, putting them on stuff, top all kinds of shoveling shit, doing a hundred. Okay. I need to backpedal a little bit here. You said you were doing like a hundred tires in a day. Like, are we like, why? Like, are they burning? Like, are they doing burnouts and shit? So the, the best way to put it is the taxi firm used to put part one tires on the taxis. So when I was fitting the tyres, they probably only had about four, three or four mil on them. And then the legal limit in the United Kingdom is 1.6 mil. So, and because they're working 24-7, they would come down to that in, in one, maybe two days, the amount of mileage they were doing. Wow. Okay, so just just for clarity, because I know what it means, but it's a lot better coming from you. What's a part one tyre? A tyre that's been taken off a vehicle that has used the tyre. This this vehicle may or may not have been in an accident or the tyres themselves have come from another country where their legal limits are a little bit different. So to the United Kingdom, our legal limit is 1.6 millimetres, whereas Germany, their minimum is 4 millimetres. So we can take the tyres from Germany and we can still get a good amount of wear out of them according to our law. Interesting. For all those folks out there that... Um... Recently, I've had discussions with, and I'm looking forward to having some more discussions with service managers and, and lead techs who squawk about how important the tire game is in our industry. What Rob has effectively just said, that there are countries with different legal limits that are significantly higher than those that we have here in Canada and the U.S., because in Canada, our, our safety, as we do a, a transfer and ownership um, the tires have to meet a certain expectation. And in Canada, it's one mil, not 1.6, it's one mil. So uh, you are taking legal limit tires from Germany, which is four millimeters, which is four times the size, four times the tread depth as we have here in Canada. And we get snow. So that's, that's that. Well, they get snow too, but I digress. So popping tires and, pulling used cars apart that were in accidents to build new cars. So you probably got a whole lot of experience in a very, very short period of time. Did you have someone, you know, working through the day with you or were you mostly solo in that first year to two years? Mostly solo. Okay. Okay. When did you perhaps, or if you, cause I don't know if this is the case, did you end up with a mentor between, you know, that first year and, and then now somebody that, that helped you through it? 
Uh, in the first year, I did have a mentor. However, I wouldn't consider him a mentor. He didn't teach me anything. It was just a case of do this or you're going to get a broom through the overalls or we're going to hang you from something. We're going to lock you in the cupboard. We're going to lock you in the toilet, that kind of thing. You know, all the shenanigans you get as a, as a, in a workshop. It was, it was that kind of thing. The stuff that we couldn't get away with now. Exactly that. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay. Noted. So trial by fire, even more so. That seems to be the common running theme here. So since then, what what's transpired since then? So you were a lot of solo, pulling stuff apart. You, you really had somebody that really just kicked your ass every day, not necessarily teaching you things, but really just making sure that you stayed driven, as it were. And you know if that's, that's the correct word. What happened between then and now? Because now you're you're not only are you still working in the trade, pulling wrenches every day, but you're making a whole lot of content. What transpired between then and now to result in what you're doing today? So it, it kind of, at that particular employment, that, that lasted a year um, for reasons I didn't want to lay in the dirt, pulling old cars apart and, and swapping parts over. You kind of, you hit your threshold and, and you, you go enough, you know, if I can do more, I want better. I don't want to be doing this forever. So I moved into commercials um, and that was anything from small, small vans to big sort of lorries. Um, just to try it more than anything, because I'd rather go through life not saying what if. I'd rather have mm-hmm. a little bit of, you know what, I've got to try this. If it don't work out, I'll try something else. Um, and that lasted two weeks. The commercial side lasted two weeks. And I saw enough in them two weeks to know I never want to touch a lorry or a van or a truck again um, <laughs> in my life. But from, from then, it was an experience, to be fair. It was an experience. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm glad I did it because... And I'll know I'm never going to do that again. Um, and I went into a, a Volkswagen specialist. Um, it was just a little local independent place, um, about four or five ramps. It was about four or five guys as well, to be fair. And that's where my passion for Volkswagen started um, because they didn't just do the maintenance and repair side of things. They also did tuning side of things. So upgrades on your engines, upgrades on your cars to make track cars, to make performance vehicles. Um, and that kind of ignited a fire in my belly. I didn't even know there was it was there. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, so I did that for a long time. And unfortunately, the company changed hands and they made they made redundancies. They got rid of a lot of staff. And I was one of them, um, which is unfortunate. But I wasn't on my own, um, but I was very, very new, sort of newly qualified. And I don't know if it's the same in Canada or in the United States, but if you've not got a lot of experience, you won't find many employers that really, really want to take you on. So it, kind of got to look for someone to a gamble if you like to to sort mm-hmm. of see where you're at and that for me was a um a group called skoda i don't know if you've heard of skoda in canada but that's part uh, of the we'll have it here but it's a, from from what i understand i've never driven one but it, from what i understand it's basically a rebranded volkswagen that's correct yeah it's made in the czech republic but it's owned by volkswagen um so i started there essentially and it was everything was totally new, and that was a dealership. That was a that was brand new car. I'd never seen a brand new car in my life. Never mind about it, I took one apart. Um, so I, I did that, and I was like a, a proper fish out of water in that point. I I didn't know if it was right for me. I didn't know if I was going to carry on in the motor trade um, because it was a new side of the motor trade I've never seen. You didn't see any broken cars really. You weren't going around in puddles trying to pull parts off cars. You were you were getting brand new four five hundred pound parts to fit on a car and and kind of learning a brand from new and it was it was all a bit daunting so i started climbing the ranks at skoda and i i didn't think i'd be able to do it i had no confidence in myself to be honest because of the previous sort of things not working out and i stuck at it and the, the i'd definitely say there was points where i thought now I, I can i can go deliver pizzas and have less stress or go and put cans of beans out on the supermarket shelves but I stuck with it. I stuck with it. And I think that's where where boy turns into man. And I started climbing the ranks. And I, we have like levels in the kingdom. You have technician, service technician, diagnostic technician, and then you have a master technician. And um, I found myself at master technician level very, very quickly, which is, is it's doable, guys. If you're out there now and you're wondering if it's doable, if you want it, it is. Um, so I spent six or seven years at Skoda and I wanted another challenge. Now this is going to sound really crazy, but I moved to Volkswagen. 
Why? Same car. <laughs> mm-hmm. But different company, different company. And although they are the same car made in the same place by the same person, they still have different rules. They have rules, regulations that are totally different, although same owner. Um, so I thought, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. So I moved over to Volkswagen. I found myself climbing the, line, the ranks there as well pretty fast. I'm like, for, for someone that was paddling in shit, pulling parts off cars to reaching master tech for a brand to then moving over to another brand and reaching a high level of diagnostic at Volkswagen. It's, it's unheard of. It's, it's not a, it's not something I ever planned. I, I sort of saw myself at a certain level of spinning filters all day. And that's pretty much where I thought I'd stay. Um, but yeah, here I am today. It was about four years ago. I started doing the content created. Um, and most people, this is probably cliche, most people said, oh, since COVID, I changed my life. I did this, I did this, right? COVID definitely pushed me to the content creation side. So many people are at home. So many people were consuming YouTube because they had nothing else to do. Um, I was what the United Kingdom or England considered a key worker because I was keeping the um, doctors going with the cars, emergency service vehicles. We were, there was only two of us in our workshop the whole sort of four months it was closed. Um, in that point, we were a bit slow. Obviously, it was a bit slow because no one was really allowed out. So it, was, it was essentially service vehicles, emergency vehicles, anything that needed to be out to do the essentials. Um, and while doing that, I thought, you know what, I can I can film some of this and maybe people at home can see just what a technician does while they're sat at home not being able to do anything. And maybe some of my videos can potentially help someone who's trying to replace the brake pads on their car at home. They've got all the time, they've got the tools, they've got the parts, but they don't really know where to start. And it kind of started from there. And boom, here we are today, 21,000 followers on TikTok and so many people messaging me just asking for advice. Um, All from really stemming from a video of how to update your sat-nav on a Volkswagen. How to up... Okay, so... There's a lot to unpack there. So first and foremost, we'll start with the most recent bit. It started with a video about how to set up a sat nav. So going back long enough, I remember the days when part of the PDI process at Dodge was installing uh, quotation marks for those that are listening, quotation marks, air quotes, installing the DVD that had the disc to download the map data for the nav. I remember before that when there was no such thing as navigation. I didn't have to check anything on a car as part of the PDI. Brand new cars at Dodge. 2002, 2003, 2004. Brand new cars. Nav was not a thing yet. And now you're talking about making content. One. About. and in, In video. And doing it about programming. Sat nav. This is all mind blowing that it's all, this is all inside of a a career span and I'm not even half done. So this is crazy. Let's go back a little bit more. You went many years at Skoda, not many though, like many in the, that I don't come across a lot of technicians who have spent seven years at one place. That is a more often a rarity to to in in my world right now of all the technicians that I speak to on a a fairly regular basis. So seven years at one brand. But to say that you reached top tier training in that brand inside of that period of time, and probably a whole lot less than that, but it's possible. And when I have technicians, and we're going to talk about something negative here for a second, when technicians come to me uh, and we're talking and we're in, in a coaching kind of arrangement and we're talking about training and they're complaining about pay and they're complaining about their service manager, they're complaining about this and they're complaining about that. And one of the questions I asked always, it depends on when it comes out, but I always ask about training. It's like, what level of training do you have with your brand? Oh, well, you know, however they phrase it in whatever brand it is, but it's equivalent most of the time is level two. So, you know, my, my registrar's wellness survey is formula, formulated so that it asks the questions, what level of brand technical training have you completed? And it's level one complete, level two complete, level three complete, and three plus. And anybody that's level two in America, because all of my data thus far is from America, is from American technicians. Level two complete means no more than $60,000 US a year. 
those are the same people that are complaining that are not making enough money, but they're unwilling to get more training. So we reflect back on to Rob here, who in seven years, so most of these people who are complaining about the pay and only level two complete are seven years or more. And here we have a gentleman who is not only Master Tech in one brand, but Master Tech in a second brand with technical training and did it inside the, did the first brand inside of seven years. So there's really no excuses to not get the technical training. It makes your life a whole lot easier from all different angles. Go back one more step here. We've got, you are as masterful with the VW style product as you can possibly be. And I commend you for that because that, that training level makes your day easier, which is also comes across in the content you make because when you speak about it, you are, everything comes across simply. And, and, and to quote uh, Albert Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Now, as an individual who has two brands worth of master technical training, which is effectively kind of saying like one and a half, that gives you not only the, the capability, but the vernacular to be able to speak about something eloquently. So, and that may be a whole lot of $10 words in a $1 conversation, but at the same time, it really illustrates what someone who is driven to do something they enjoy can do with technical training and then beyond. Um, one of the other questions, and I'm diatribing here a little bit, folks, and let me try and wrap this up quickly. But one of the other challenges that technicians come with, it's like, I don't know what to do next. Like I've been a technician for 15 years. I don't know what to do next. I don't think there's a lot out there for me. And I've made a sheet of about 40 different career paths that you could take after being a technician because our problem solving skills, like Rob sees on all of his content and Rob, all of the problem solving skills translate into so many other things, your understanding of systems and how they can operate that breaks into people, processes and product. So if you have any questions out there, folks that are listening and watching, there's so much that you can do after being a mechanic or continue to be while being a mechanic, like both of us are, we're making content. So yep. that's awesome. What would be, Rob, what would be one of the challenges that you've come across, let's say, before you started making content, what would be one of the challenges that you came across about being a mechanic? What, are, what is a, maybe a major challenge that you came across? Every day is a school day is, is the challenge. A lot of the challenges we, we sort of find now is you're against the brand. Now it's not, it's all good and well working for a brand, but if you've ever dealt with the warranty processes on things, wow, that, that is a minefield of shenanigans that you, you really don't want to get into. So I'd say the stresses and stuff of that are the goalposts moving and the, the targets moving all the time as to, to where your knowledge should be and where it's going. Okay. That's, that's a polite way of saying that uh, the labor time goalposts are constantly moving. And, and I, I appreciate that very much. And it's true. You know, a lot of the time, some of these labor times are not are regularly adjusted. And without any, uh, and this is the part where it irks me the most. Instead of giving context, and problem solving and solutions as to why the labor times move. They just change the labor time. That is my biggest, my biggest pet peeve in that. Now, are there people out there maximizing? There's a polite and professional way of saying it. Maximizing the things that they can do in order to shirk the time. Yes, there are. What I say to those people, and I'm going to say it as clearly as I can run the time required so the rest of us can make money. And when you find those things that allows you to maximize the time, share that information discreetly with the rest of us turning wrenches. That way, when they catch on, we've already all figured it out. And then we can all still continue to make money. So I appreciate that very much. So as that is a little bit of advice, let's let's lead that into to, you know, maybe what's one what's one of your piece of advice what's or what's a piece of advice that you would give a mechanic to, to help them be happier, healthier, more productive tomorrow? 
don't stop setting yourself personal goals. Do not stop setting yourself. If you think you've hit the roof of maximum where you can go, there are avenues absolutely everywhere. So say if you're a master tech, you can go down specialism routes, you can go down, you can learn how to be a teacher, you can you can learn how to do everything. There is never an end game in this trade. You will never stop unless you want to. Awesome. I can back that 100%. It's Those are the goals. Unlike uh, goalposts that are moving out of our outside of our control, when we set goals, make action plans to meet those goals, hit those goals, and then create new goals, it allows us to keep moving forward in a direction that we want to instead of instead of having other things set for us. And well, let me try and see if I can say this this phrase because this is one of the most important phrases um, that you can perhaps hear today is if you don't understand or convey your value, somebody else will set it for you. And this goes towards your goals. If you don't set your own goals, somebody else will set goals for you and they're not going to be ones beneficial to you. So I really appreciate that piece of advice. Really appreciate that piece of advice, Rob. I really do. Let's go to the next step here because I'm going to ask you a question here. What do you have coming up for content wise that these folks need to be listening to or watching or coming up to? Because I, I know that you're publishing a ton of content uh, on your YouTube channel. I'm going to make sure everybody can, can get that, whether they're on Spotify or on, or on YouTube or on LinkedIn. There's going to be a link uh, for you folks to check out Rob's channels. So please do that. But what is what would be the, the ideal person that should be watching or consuming your content? People that want to do little bits and bobs themselves, because I understand massively that times are hard and money's tight, budgets are stretched. And if I can show in a way where you guys can do it safely, so I'm not necessarily saying brakes, tires, that kind of thing, but if you can change your own bulb without having to go to a shop, if you can change your wiper blades without having to go to a shop, you're then reducing your outgoings to obviously cars are a big part of our of our monthly expenditure and, and having to repair one as well. And you're never gonna know. You can't budget for car repairs because you don't know from one minute to the next if it's going to be a good month and not break down or it's going to be a bad month and spend all month broken down. But if you can trim the little bits of extra money away by fitting your own wipers, fitting your own bulbs and doing general maintenance checks to stop a small problem becoming a big one, then I think that's what my content is is driving at more than anything to, to help these people with that cost of living because it's, it's crazy at the minute and it is in every country in the world. It's not just here in the United Kingdom. No, it's the price, the cost of living is asinine absolutely asinine um the cost of this so recently there was a, a study done and just to get kind of canadian context recently there was a study done so the greater toronto area is the area that kind of surrounds toronto here and here in ontario canada and there's roughly like five six million people give or take in the whole area that is the gta and they said that in order for a single person a single human being who's of adult age to be able to rent, not buy, but rent a place uh, to feed themselves, to have the basic utilities pays, heat, hydro, um, electric in some countries it's called, um, heat, hydro, air conditioning, whatever the case may be, the basic, the, the internet um, are ridiculous cell phone plans because most of most of the landlines are starting to go away of the dodo because many apartment complexes don't even have a phone line going into them. Um, so the basic necessities, not including a car, um, but also including enough money to allow folks to be mentally, physically, and emotionally well, meaning they're capable of affording to go to a gym, a uh, capable of going to professionals to maintain their mental health and um, capable of doing social things as a human being uh, to do things with friends, friends and family, just that, that bare minimum. And they wrapped that all into a little ball and they did it, the study. And the study was that in order for that person to do that successfully, they need to earn $61,000 after taxes here in Ontario, which is $82,000 a year. 
So put that a little bit more in context. Think about that for a second. As a 19-year-old human being here in, here in Canada, in the GTA, you are now out of high school. And let's assume that you aren't in university. So you are an adult. You're it's after high school. You are now expected to work and pay, find a place and pay rent so you can go to work. You need to make $82,000 a year in order to be neutral. Not happy. Not depressed. Not, not bankrupt or anything else like just to be neutral is $82,000 a year. Our minimum wage in Ontario is $16.25 an hour. You would need to make $39 an hour in order to achieve that. So cost of living right now <laughs> in, in close to where I live is ridiculous. So if anybody's listing right now that happens to be in the GTA and happen to employ people under the age of 25, Please, please take that into account. Rob, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes and giving us little tidbits here and there about your life and how you grew up in, in the trade. And I really appreciate your piece of advice. Yeah, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. So I think that's a, that's a great spot to end. So folks, that is the end of another Wrench Turners podcast. And don't worry about it, folks. There will be another one coming next week. We have stuff booked right out into August. So we are more than set. And uh, don't forget, we do have a recruiter special coming in June and July. Watch out for that. Uh, we do have a quote for the week to end off the week. Um, it, it's a little bit, it might be a little bit resonant, might not be because we have a Brit on the show today and I've quoted another Brit. So Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Winston Churchill. Folks, remember, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.